Hi, my name is Brad, and I'm the pastor at Community Fellowship. Thank you so much for tuning in to this online gathering. What you're going to see today is people worshiping God with great music and listening to teaching from the Bible that will help them live their lives. And we're excited about the fact that you're joining with us in that. If you have any questions, please ask them. If you have statements to make, make comments. And if you think this could help people around you, share this video so that others may join us. Thank you so much for being a part of this. I'll come back and see you again in the middle and the end of the video. Good morning, Community Fellowship. I hope everybody had a great Thanksgiving. Um, I'm still recovering, still in turkey coma. Anybody else? Turkey coma? Okay. Well, if you would, please stand and worship with us today. covers me and raises dead man's life.
every blessing. Every blessing you pour out, I'll turn back to praise. When the darkness closes in, Lord, still I will say, Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your name. Blessed be the name. like. That song uh, always reminds me of a particular moment when I heard it. I was in a worship gathering with a group of people shortly after uh, they had lost a young girl who passed away far too early. And the group that was singing that morning uh, knew that this song was scheduled. And they came to me and said, hey, let, may, we might take out the part that it says you give and take away, like for today. For today, let's take that part out and not do that because everybody was dealing with the pain of losing this little girl. And some of the folks closest to the family said, no, no, we're not going to take it out. We're going we're to leave that in because that's the greatest truth we need to hear right now is that we have to trust the Lord in moments of, of difficulty. It's easy to trust God when you get what you want, isn't it? It's so much, so much more challenging to trust the Lord when you're not getting exactly what you want or exactly the way you wanted it or exactly the pace at which you wanted it to come. And so we worship today a Lord who's big enough to handle our concerns. He's big enough to handle our doubts, our worries. And we can come to him knowing in the midst of things that we can trust him, even if we're not getting exactly what we wanted exactly right now. It's been a week of Thanksgiving. Anybody have an opportunity to eat a good meal this last week? Do that? Anybody have a chance to be thankful, kind of outwardly thankful for something? Maybe tell somebody or tell the Lord what you've been thankful for. That's great. That's great. Um, this has been a good week for us. Let's make sure that the attitude of Thanksgiving is something that continues and moves forward. And it's not just a holiday. It's a lifestyle, you know, not, not just a day. It's a way of thinking all the time. Gratitude is the right attitude all the time. So uh, if you would, let's pray. And then we're going to take up the offering ushers. If you would join me down front and we're going to ask the Lord to bless this and thank him for what he's done in our life. And then we're going to worship him through giving and, and song. Jesus, we trust you. Thank you so much for everything that you have given us. And we trust you with the things you've taken away. We thank you, Lord, for the things you've entrusted to us and allowed us to be a part of. We also trust you, Lord, with the things that we were not a part of, that we didn't get to do or didn't get to see yet. Father, we pray a prayer of thanksgiving to you, knowing that you have been good to us. You have cared for us. You've taken care of us and you have been faithful. Father, help us to be faithful. We trust you. In your name we pray. Amen. All these pieces 
broken and scattered, in mercy gathered, mended and whole, empty-handed but not forsaken, I've been set free. take our failures, you take our weakness, you set your treasures in jars of clay, so take this heart, Lord, and I'll be your vessel, the world to
take communion together this morning. And we do this uh, as uh, kind of with a spirit of thanksgiving, but also specifically an attitude or desire to remember. If you could just right now where you are, would you think about a moment when God has truly been good to you? A moment when he protected you? A moment when he forgave you? A moment when maybe he directed you? Be very specific. It's one thing to say, Lord, thank you for the blessings in my life, but let's get specific here. What what, what are you talking about? Which blessing? Which one? Think about it for a second. Again, one of the greatest differences between being a Christ follower and simply being a part of a religion is that we aren't just about principles and rules. We're about relationship, knowing Christ, walking with him, listening to him, communicating with him, hearing from him, following him. And in the midst of that, we're going to have specific memories about times when God has been specifically good to us. So as Julie leads us in this next song, I invite you to come down the aisle, walk right up to the communion tables on each side, take a piece of bread and ingest it. Take it right there, remembering what Jesus has done for you. Pick up one of the cups, and just as Jesus led his disciples to do, Take a drink and remember that this is his body, this is his blood for you. Let's, let's, let's just let this be a moment of great thanksgiving. If you need a moment when you're standing there, don't be in a hurry. The people behind you can wait for their moment. You, you take your moment. If you do this together, maybe a couple or some friends or with a child, and you want to talk among yourselves right at the table, you can take that moment. That's fine. Take, take that moment. And let's be thankful to him. Let's worship him, let's celebrate him, and let's remember everything that he has done. Lord, thank you for this moment. As we as a people come to remember you and remember all that you've done in our lives, remind us greatly, Lord, so that we may be thankful. In your name we pray, amen. I encourage you to come. You call me out upon the water, a great unknown, where feet may fail. There I find you in the mystery, where oceans deep, my faith will say. And I will call upon your name And keep my eyes above the waves When oceans rise My soul will rest in your embrace I am yours And you abounds in deepest waters your sovereign hand will be my God where feet may fail and fear surrounds me you never fail and you won't start now Spirit in the-
Lord, we trust you and thank you with this moment for reminding us of all the times you've been there for us. May we continue that attitude of thanksgiving. May we be generous. May we be filled with, with, with just a desire to, to love. We trust you, Jesus. In your name we pray. Amen. Seated. If you haven't had a chance yet to meet Julie, who was to your right of me here, Julie Buford, she is... Uh, been brought on as one of our kind of interim worship leader for the next few months, and uh, I just love the girl. She does such a good job, and uh, if you haven't got a chance to meet her yet, you should. She's she's definitely worth knowing. So to Alan and everybody else uh, who was a part of the team this morning, good job, you guys. Thanks a lot. Uh, today's a little different. I'm I'm not really going to preach. I just I just want to talk to you about something kind of from the heart, um, and it's a positive thing. It's a good thing, but. Uh, the, the real way to discuss this topic has is, is always been something that kind of slips through my fingers, and I, I think I'm not alone. A lot of pastors have a hard time kind of figuring out how to talk about this topic. So I'd like to just tell you a little bit of my story, uh, to kind of background. Uh, I grew up in a really good church, about 10 minutes from here, actually, Lone Oak First Baptist Church. My uncle was the pastor there when I was a kid, and, and so I was there from nine months before I was born until I was 18. Um, and I'm, I'm a Gen Xer, so I was born in 1973. Uh, it's a very small generation in between the two largest generations in American history, the baby boomers and then uh, the, the whatever they call the group after. They have like 11 names for the group after me. So Gen Y, uh, I don't know, that big, big, big group. So there's just a few of us, though. There weren't many of those born in the early 70s. Um, the Vietnam War had happened, and people were kind of scared to have kids, I think, at the time. <laughs> there just weren't many happening. So uh, I grew up in a church where, you know, we had probably 10 or 15 youth that were my age and were very close, and, and uh, what happened in my youth group typically was that maybe 5, 10, 15 percent of us went into ministry, and everybody else quit going to church. Like that's, that was like, that's pretty much what, what, what happened, and, and I, I saw this for the first time uh, a year after I went off to college. I hadn't been to my home church in about a year. I was home for, I don't know, Christmas or something. And I went to my Sunday school class. I went to my college-age Sunday school class, and I was excited about seeing all of the 30 or 40 teenagers that I would have known from the year before. And when I got there, I was the only person there. There was nobody else. Nobody. Nobody, nobody was there. They were all gone. And I started asking questions about where are they and, where, and, where, where, and, and what I found was just that uh, many of my age group counterparts were just gone. And and so it broke my heart, and that began for me uh, kind of a big part of what kind of motivates or drives me. And, and so here's, here's what I found over, the, over many years. Uh, for the next couple of years after that, I pastored some churches that were challenging. Uh, some of the folks from those churches might be watching this morning. I have no intention to say anything harsh or mean, but there were just good, like, you know, like, like some churches give you a reason not to go to them. You know what I mean? Like, I don't know if you've ever been around one of those churches, but like there were some reasons, you know, and and I, I remember going through this feeling of kind of understanding what my fellow friends were feeling. Like, oh my gosh, I get why. Because see, I grew up in a church where, we, again, everything always seemed perfect. And if there was ever a disagreement, I didn't know about it. You know, and if uh, I didn't know, all I, everything was perfect, I thought. But then you become a pastor and you start going to those kinds of meetings and you deal with people with attitudes and you see business meetings go wrong and that kind of thing, right? Uh, for instance, uh, just a funny story. Uh, one of my first... One of my first business meetings as a senior pastor, uh, there were 24 people in the room besides me, so 25 people in the room, really, really big church, and, uh, and, and there was a vote, and the vote was out of nowhere, we were voting to spend every dime that we had in savings to, to extend our fellowship hall by 10 feet, and the reason was the church had started growing, and a woman in the church did not get to sit at her seat, and so out of nowhere, she made a motion to spend all the money that we had to extend a wall by 10 feet so that she could have her seat back. That's really what it was. 
And so I remember that, that we were talking about it, and I'm just sharing this with you just to let you know that sometimes there are frustrating things about churches. It can happen. Uh, in this particular moment, here's what happened. Uh, I'm, I'm in the front. I'm, 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 the, I'm the guy. You know, I'm the guy at the pedestal who's like accepting motions and stuff. And so she stands up, makes a motion, build a new thing. There's disagreement about it, and she calls for a vote, so I, I get a second, so I have to, ex- I, okay, let's vote. And it was 12 to 12. 12 yeses, 12 noes. It was actually 12 noes and 11 yeses, and then she looked at her husband with this real mean face, and he went, okay, yeah, I'll vote too. Yeah, like, <laughs> I'll vote yes too. So it's 12 to 12. Uh, a deacon in the back said, Pastor, you got to split the vote. I said, you stinking crazy you think i'm i'm not voting i'm not i'm not not, i've been here five months and i'm 19 years old there's no way in the world i'm getting my in the middle of that you know and so those are the kinds of things that would i had another pastor friend that said there was a church vote over what brand of toilet paper to use and like like that kind of craziness that can happen here's what's happened i think uh for many people over the last 25 years or so um there has been not only a pulling away from uh organized church stuff but even sometimes even when we come together a lot of times and i'm again i'm just speaking kind of of many of my age group a lot of times what happens is that church is developing into something that you kind of do to make it worth for people to go see so like it's a bigger production their excellence is more important like we make sure that things start on time and stop on time and and there is an element of even um even uh, entertainment kind of that goes along with like great light shows and the sound is good and like we do a lot of those things and and I was one of the guys who early on in the in the late 90s I was one of the guys telling churches we need to do that you know in order to reach people that we weren't reaching and, and here's what I found here's what I found at least in my past I found that when um, when the church is something that is done to impress people and to convince people to come You have to watch out. You have to be very careful because what can end up happening is that church can become a spectator sport if you don't watch out. Like, it can become something people come to watch. and People just come to watch it. And then when you ask of people, hey, we need you to engage. Like, we need you to, like, do something. I need you to, I mean, effort, you know, like, sacrifice, like, help. A lot of times, especially for those younger than me, a lot of times those are foreign terms, like, it would be like, I, th- I think to a lot of folks, I think that it feels like, let's say you go to the movies in Paducah, and at the end of the movie you went to see, you're like, I liked that movie. But then the guy who runs the movie theater comes up to you with a mop and says, I need you to clean the floors. And you're thinking, dude, I just, I just come here. Like, I, I, I don't work here. I just, I just came to the movies. I, 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 don't, I don't think that it's my job to sweep the floors. I, I just came here, you know. And, and a lot of times I'm afraid that what happens in a lot of people's lives is that church begins to feel more like a movie theater than something you're really a part of, like you're really engaged in. And so discussions about things like, hey, here's an area where you can serve, or hey, here's a way you can give, or here's a way to be generous. A lot of times I think, have you seen the comedian with the little puppets that just goes, whoo, you know, like the, like a lot of times I think things just kind of go right over our heads because It does, to some people, if you don't watch out, it kind of feels like the manager at the theater is asking you to sweep the floors, and you don't work there, so why would you do that, right? So what I'd like to talk to you about today, just for a a brief moment, is is what it means to really contribute to the movement of God that you're a part of that we have called church, because it's so much more than going somewhere and watching something. It's so much more than going some, somewhere and observing something. Um, this is about who we are, and this is about what's valuable to us, and this is about what matters. And, 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 and so, if you would, we're going to read from 2 Corinthians chapter 9, one of my absolute favorite texts uh, in the New Testament. It's a short chapter. It's only, I think, 15 verses. I'm going to read all of it to you. Uh, and, and if you would, let me give you a little background. Um, the church started in Jerusalem, right? That, that's the town where a lot of this began. And, uh, and they sent missionaries out, people like Paul and Silas and Barnabas. And they started lots of churches in other areas. But then a few years later, what happened was that many of the new churches were flourishing. They were growing. They were doing great. But the church in Jerusalem, the one that started it all, they were actually struggling. They were really having a hard time. And so Paul goes around to a lot of the new churches 
that he had started, and he asks them to contribute to the church in Jerusalem. We need to help them. Like, they started us, now they're struggling, let's help them. And so he goes around asking churches to help the, the church that, that they, don't, like they don't even know these people. They've not met them before, but can you help them? And, and it just so happens that the church in Corinth responds very well. Like, they really want to help. And if you've read much in, in the Corinthian books, you know that the church in Corinth doesn't do very well at many things. Like, they really struggle. They, they make lots of bad decisions. And so for them to be doing well on this topic is such a big deal that they get a whole chapter in the New Testament about it. So Paul's kind of bragging on them and encouraging them. I want to read to you what he says to the church in Corinth about really contributing to the movement of God that they call church. Okay, here's what it says. Now it is superfluous for me to write to you about the ministry for the saints. For I know your readiness, of which I boast about to the people of Macedonia. In, in other words, I know you're ready to do well here, okay? Saying that Achaia has been ready since last year, and your zeal has stirred up most of them. But I am sending the brothers so that our boasting about you may not prove empty in this matter, so that you may be ready, okay? So here's what he's saying practically. They have said in Corinth, we want to contribute, we want to help, we're getting it ready, we're taking up offerings, we're getting ready to do that. Paul is saying, okay, that's awesome, I've been bragging on how good you, you're doing, how great your attitude is, and now I'm going to send these two guys, and they're going to come with the, you know, with like the first century like, you know, like, like bank truck, and they're going to come and pick up your offering and bring it back. So that's what's happening. And then he says, uh, as, as I said you would be, verse 4, otherwise, if some Macedonians come with me and find that you are not ready, we would be humiliated. Now, this is that moment where he goes, hey, wait a second, guys. I have a lot of faith in you, and I have bragged on you. So this is not the time not to follow through. <laughs> like, like I have, they're, they're, I, you're going to do great. I've bragged on how great you're going to do, but now you really need to follow through because everybody's watching. And, and your willingness to follow through means more than just you because it's motivating everybody else. So I really need you to, you know, kind of have your game face on and get this done and do it well. It's a very important thing, okay? So we don't want to be humiliated, he says, okay, to say nothing of you for being confident. So I want to keep building your confidence. Verse 5, so I thought it necessary to urge the brothers to go on ahead to you and arrange in advance for the gift you have promised so that it may be ready as a willing gift, not as an extraction. In other words, uh, I, I don't, I'm not coming to pressure you. I'm coming to help you. I don't want you to feel like anything was taken from you. I want you to, I want you to do what you need to do. I, I, I want you to give the way you want to give. I don't want it to feel like, you know, the mob boss has shown up at your door asking where it is. It's not that. It's, it's, they're going to spend time with you. They're going to be there. They're going to help you. So verse 6 says, the point is this. Whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. And whoever sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. In other words, you put a little in, you get a little out. You put a lot in, you get a lot out. That's kind of a good way of thinking about life. Each one must give as he has decided in his heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver, okay? Again, that's a great text about this isn't about being pressured, and this isn't about anybody talking you into anything. This is about you doing what you are convinced you need to do and doing it in a way that's cheerful and excited, okay? Verse 8, and God is able to make all grace abound to you so that having all sufficiency in all things at all times, you may abound in every good work. So abounding is about going over and above and thriving. It's another good, good word there. As it is written in verse 9, he quotes the Old Testament. He has distributed freely. He has given to the poor. His righteousness endures forever. Now what the point here is, is that he's making sure that we remember that God has provided our needs. He's given to the poor. But even greater than any financial gift God's ever given us, he's given us righteousness, which is something money could have never bought and we could have never gotten on our own. So his righteousness endures forever. I, I love that this verse appears right here because in the midst of reminding them to do what they should do, he also reminds them that God is the one who takes care of them even when they don't do what they should have done. Right? That's a really good, graceful comment, okay? Verse 10 says this, he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will supply and multiply your seed for sowing and increasing the harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched in every way 
to be generous in every way, which through us will produce thanksgiving to God. Now, this, this kind of builds on a, a philosophy of life. In our world, sometimes, and this is sometimes what goes along with kind of the way we do money in our country, in our world, is a lot of times we live as if the next week is the only important week. Like, like you guys have heard about living week to week, right? Or, gosh, i got to get my paycheck in the bank today because i got bills coming out tomorrow and, and that kind of thing. This attitude is really more of saying, hey, listen, let's not live just to provide what we have to have. Let's think in a more bountiful, overwhelmed, kind of big picture way that says, I trust God to provide in my family, in my life, enough that not only will I have enough for my family, but, but sharing and being generous is part of who I'm going to be all the time. Because God is always going to provide enough for me to share. This is a, a very important thing for us. Uh, this past week, I think, is probably a very good example of that. Did anybody eat a meal this week with someone you don't normally eat with? Like, did anyone provide a meal for someone that you don't normally cook for or buy? Yeah, I mean, my, my family's, uh, my mom and dad's family, uh, they had, we had two families come to Thanksgiving with us that are not kin to us. One family I met for the first time at Thanksgiving dinner. It was just kind of new, just new friends that mom and dad had said, hey, we always have too much. Come on over. It's great. Like that attitude is what this text is describing. Is Wouldn't it be wonderful to live in a way that says we're always going to have enough to share. We're always going to have enough to be a blessing to others. That's just how we're going to be, okay? So he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will supply and multiply your seed for sowing and increasing the harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched in every way to be generous in every way. So God wants to enrich our lives so that we can be generous in every way, which through us will produce thanksgiving to God. So in other words, the, the, what he's painting here is the idea that God enriches us, we're generous, and it makes us thankful. Okay, that's, that's ultimately what's happening. For the ministry of this service is not only supplying the needs of the saints, but is also overflowing in many thanksgivings to God. That's what this is about. It's about keeping us thankful. By their approval of this service, they will glorify God because of your submission that comes from your confession of the gospel of Christ and the generosity of your contribution for them and for all others. While they long for you and pray for you because of the surpassing grace of God upon you, thanks be to God for his inexpressible gift. Beautiful, beautiful text of scripture. So can I talk to you for just a second and I'm going to be done about an extremely important issue, and that is, how do I, as a person, engage my church and the ministry of God that he's doing in my life in such a way that it's not just something I go watch, but it's part of who I am? There are a few ways. First is this. Uh, you are gifted. You are gi like You have valuable gifts, things that you can contribute to ministry teams and, and observe, you know, moments to, like, I guarantee you, you are gifted. And not everyone knows how they're gifted. Like, a lot of times I know you might look in the mirror and go, I don't know what I could do to help. I'm not sure how I could help. And I promise you that as you will open yourself up relationally to other people, those people will help you see your gifts. Like, let me ask this. Have you ever had somebody in your life that you saw them as having all these ways they could, like, all these beautiful things about them? But if they were to talk about themselves, they probably wouldn't say much. Like they didn't, they didn't necessarily recognize the beauty that you see in them. It's one of my favorite things to do. I love to see beauty in someone who doesn't see it in themselves and then help them see what's really there. I love to, like, if I get a chance to do that, it makes my month, you know? It makes my month. And so uh, that's something that we as a church want to make sure we're always doing, that we're always helping people see the beauty and the potential in them that they might, they might not see in themselves. If you're here today and you're thinking, man, I, I don't want to just go to church to watch. I don't. I don't want to just be a part of a church to observe. I want to engage. I want to find a way to, to contribute. I want to be a part of this. So the first thing is this. Be aware that I promise you, if God has assigned you to this church, then there's a need here that you're meant to fill. Guarantee it. It might be teenagers. It might be with youth ministry. It might be kids, it might be hospitality and caring for people, it might be food, I don't know what it is, it might just simply be an ear to listen to someone who has something they need to share, uh, but God is going to use you, if you'll let him, if you'll just, and, and, and letting God use you 
is very similar to volunteering to serve. That's pretty much like, like okay, like that's, that's how I'm going to do it. How, what can I do? How can I, how can I help? And a lot of times people will say to me, but I don't know where to serve. And here's what I want to tell you. Don't make long-term commitments. Call somebody up and say, hey, can I try serving in your ministry? I'll do it twice. I'm going to reevaluate after twice. I want to think about it. Like, can, I, can I serve in your ministry? I'd love to help. Don't, don't like make me high, you know, highly responsible. Just let me go sit through it. I just want to see. And what you'll find is that you have values that you don't even, are valuables that you didn't even know you had. And, and you'll find yourself helpful. For instance, we have a person who comes here on Wednesday nights, an adult, comes here on Wednesday nights, and I've just observed this. This is not organized. It's not planned. I don't think it's written down anywhere. But we have an adult who comes on Wednesday nights and hangs out with a child who has some social anxiety. And, and it just so happens that this one adult looks for this one child every week and always connects, always hugs, always asks about their day. And I don't know if the child knows they're being cared for, and I don't know that the adult realizes how important it is that they're doing this. But in the long run, from my perspective, a really beautiful thing is happening. Because a, a person said, I'll do that. I'll help. Of course I get involved. So, so just dive in, right? Just dive in. But in addition to that, let's talk a little more practically about kind of ways to contribute. You guys know the word, uh, I grew up hearing this word all the time. You guys know the word tithing? You heard that word before? It's not a word we talk about a whole lot. Um, I, I, it, it's an Old Testament phrase, and it's, uh, it's from a time when Jewish people would give a percentage of their income. And, and so let me give you a little heritage on the history there, okay? First of all, uh, in ancient Hebrew worlds, uh, they didn't have like taxes for roads and such. So instead of, you know, raising a military with money from your, you know, income tax or your property tax or your sales tax, you know, instead of taking care of roads and things like that from those things, the, the government and the, and the religious group were very much kind of connected as one big thing. And so everybody religiously would give a tithe, a percentage of their giving. And, and it went to the king or whoever was leading, and through that, it was used in a hundred different ways to, to fund lots of different things. In fact, even though the literal term tithe means tenth, by the end of the Old Testament, some scholars say that a tithe was more like 35%. It was pretty, it's like living in Canada. You know what I mean? Like it was a bunch. Okay, so, so here's, here's the interesting thing. Uh, one of my really good friends, he, he, he said this. He said, tithing is biblical, it's just not Christian. I thought, that's an interesting factor. Here's what he meant by that. He meant, as a, as a rule, it's, it's biblical in that it's in the Bible, but it's Jewish. It's not, it's not New Testament, Old Testament. I kind of see where he's coming from. I understand there's not a lot of teaching about tithing in the New Testament. You don't, you don't find much there. You do find one moment when Jesus is talking about it, and he expresses to the, the Pharisees that they, that they need to keep doing it. They need to do it. So there's a, there's a positive comment there. Here's why you're going to hear that. I don't tend to use that word a lot, but I want to tell you why. I've known a lot of folks who, for them, here's what their contribution would be, is they would get a calculator and a pencil, and they wanted to make sure they didn't break a rule, and they wanted to make sure they didn't make God mad, you know, in their mind, and so they'd figure out to the 10th exactly what they need to give, and then they would give it. But at that point, kind of like the attitude that came with it was not the kind of attitude that I just read. It was like, fine, I paid God's taxes. He, maybe he'll shut up now. Leave me alone. I won't feel bad about myself. You know what? Like there was this kind of like negative kind of emotion that went with it. And I never really want people to feel that way or have that because that is definitely not the way God wants you to feel. And, and I don't tend to use that word very much because I don't ever want to coerce anybody into do anything. I promise you, I'd rather you not give than give and be mad about it. All right? I really, really would. In fact, I'm going to say you're robbing yourself of your own blessing right there. Like, just don't, just, just, just don't, okay? Now, now, the problem is this. This is where it gets really swirly here. Is as a Christian, what we've said is that we, we use this kind of term. We say, gave my life to Jesus. Have you used that phrase before? Like, turned my life over to Christ, Okay. Uh, submitted myself to the Lord. Like we say those kinds of phrases. So when we get saved, what we're saying is that everything I have is God's now. Everything I have is God's. So one of the biggest reasons I don't use that T word that often is that I want to make sure that you and I realize that it's not that 90% of it's ours and 10% of it's God's. 
It's all God. It's all His. My life is His. It's all His. And if I don't see it that way, then something's really jacked up about the way I see my faith. If I forget that everything I have is His, everything, then, so I said something in a sermon one time that really got me in a lot of trouble. I'm going to say it again. Um, I said last year, it's been eight years ago now, but last year I, I bought a tractor. And it was the coolest tractor. Like I, like I never thought I would get to have a Kubota four-wheel drive tractor with a front-end loader and a backhoe. And like it was the coolest toy for a mid-30-something guy with small children to ever get to buy. And I remember the day that I, find, that I signed on the dotted line and bought it, I remember the Lord grabbing my attention and saying, if I let you buy this, it's not just for you. And so I remember saying, okay, if, if people close to me need a tractor, and the Lord let me buy that one, then I have to let them use it whenever they need it. And it was gone for the next six months after that sermon. For me, though, that's the issue. Is Guess what? If I have a truck, I don't have a truck. God has a truck. If I have a house, I don't have a house. God has a house. You hearing me? Right? If I have a wallet, I don't have a wallet. God has a wallet. And so I don't want you or me living by rules that go, this, this, I'm going to give that to God, but this is mine. That, that's not really, it's really not, it's really not yours. And, and I want to be really clear. Uh, it's the Lord's whether you realize it's the Lord's or not, and he'll get it if he wants it. Now, he's not vindictive, and he's not angry, and he's not mean, and he's not, he's not going to go up. Oh, you forgot your tide check last week, so you're going to lose your job next week. No, it's not. That's not the way the Lord works, okay? I don't want you to think that way. But I do want you to understand that everything the Lord wants to happen, happens. And I'm his, and you're his, and you're his, and you're his. And, and so I want to live my life in a way that says, Lord, how can I take what you're allowing me to hold on to that is yours, and how can I contribute to the world and the things that you care about? How can I contribute? Because at the end of the day, for me, when I get a chance to walk through whatever the gates look like and spend time with whatever the mansion looks like, and when I get to, I don't honestly care about any of that. When I, when I get to talk to Jesus face to face, I want to have a lot of stories to tell about ways that he and I did stuff together while I was living. I want to have, I want to have a lot of memories of ways that he contributed to my life and I got to contribute to what he cares about. And, and, and so in the long run, I don't have a tractor. God has a tractor. You see what I'm saying? I, 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 now, so as I finish out, let me just say these three things. From that text, when you get really practical, from that text, when it comes to my giving, financial giving and contribution and help, there's really three realities there. That I, you can read Second uh, Corinthians 9 again, read it several times. You'll see these three qualities. The first quality is that giving is regular or maybe a, the word reliable might be a better word. In other words, uh, my church can count on me. Like if 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 like like in that story, it's the church in Corinth helping the church in Jerusalem, and he's saying, "Look, the church in Jerusalem needs your help, but more important than your promise, they need to know you're actually going to do what you said you're going to do. They, it needs to be reliable." And so I'm just saying that it, it, your giving should be reliable. It should be like you can count on me. And I don't mean like public, like waving it in the air or making a big deal or any of that at all, I'm just saying that, that, that we can move forward with, we can move forward with courage because you and a hundred other people just like you are here. And, it, and it's reliable, okay? Like, and that's true not just with giving, that's true with service, that's true with action, that's any type of contribution you're making with yourself, with your talent, with your abilities, whatever, is, it's reliable. Like, you know what? Carla told me she's going to be here. Guess what? That means that unless the bus runs over, Carla, she's going to be here. You know, she said she would, so she will. And I can trust that. She's reliable. Okay, that's, that's and I use her because she is. So that's just such a great example. But uh, that's what I mean. Like, our giving should be reliable. The second thing is not only should it be reliable, but it should be sacrificial. Here's what I mean, okay? If a multimillionaire writes a check for $5,000, 
big deal. They didn't feel that. They didn't, that didn't matter. Some, some folks, when they come to me for counsel, they're like, Brad, but in order for me to be a giver, that means I'm going to have to sell my bass boat. It's not your bass boat. It's God's bass boat. God doesn't want you to have the bass boat so that you can be a contributor, then that's what you're supposed to do. I love you, but you gave your life to Jesus, and it's his. So listen to him. It's a better life. You live with thanksgiving, you live with graciousness, and you get to do Sacrificing for the greater good, listen to me really carefully. I'm talking about even bigger than church stuff. Sacrificing for the greater good is something that a lot of people in our generation don't know how to do. I'm 44 now. They call us the me generation for a reason. Okay? And, and we've struggled with that. You know, my, my parents' generation had to go to Vietnam. My grandparents' generation had to go to France and Germany. Like they spent major portions of their life and lost friends and family members and things for the sake of the greater good. That's, that's why they call my grandparents' generation the greatest generation in American history, because of the fact that they get the value of sacrificing. But I don't know that we do. We, we, we have a tendency, if we don't watch out, to kind of always just look for what's in it for me. That's why a lot of pastors you'll hear talk on this topic spend all their time focused on the blessings stuff. Like, look, if you'll give, God will bless you. If you'll give, God will bless you. Here's, here's the real problem with that. I'm not saying it's not true. I mean, you heard me read it in the text. It's there. If you sow in a big way, you reap in a big way. You know, that's, that's true. God does bless people for doing the right thing. But that's not why you do the right thing. Well, let me ask you this. In raising your children, which is better? Your son or daughter does something beautiful and gracious, and they don't even care if you saw them do it or not. Versus the little boy going, Mommy, you see me? I'm holding the door. Mommy, did you notice? Did you see that I did it? Did you see that I did it? You know, like, like, like okay, that's cute, but that's not awesome. What's awesome is, from a distance, you see your children doing something fantastic, and nobody saw them do it. They didn't even know. They didn't do it for your approval or to be seen or to be bragged on. They did it because it's who they are. See, that's what it means to be sacrificial. Is our giving, like, am I supposed to feel it? Absolutely, I'm supposed to feel it. Absolutely. And I, and I would just throw this out there. It's a good exercise. It's a good exercise for you to think about the things you have to not buy in order to give. It's a good exercise. Like, you know, I could have had an 80-inch rounded TV to watch the Super Bowl on, but I couldn't do that and be a giver. I'm going to be a giver. I'm cool with my TV. See what I'm saying? I'm, I'm excited. I'm much, more, I'm much more excited about feeling like we contributed to something much bigger than me. we got to sacrifice. We just do. There's no way around it. And the third thing is it's supposed to be cheerful. Now, I know this is, this is, this is interesting, okay? I'm going to tell you a story. It's a fun one. I, when I was in, in high school, I went to something called uh, Governor's School for the Arts. And it was, I was a singer, and, and, I, and I got to go stay in Louisville, this this little white kid from Livingston County, Kentucky, who had never been away from any, anything else, I got to go stay in an inner city college campus, downtown Louisville, and I did not look like most everybody else around me. And for three weeks, I hung out with these weird, different, strange people. And one day, we decided to go to church. And they, they would only let us go to church if we could walk there. They wouldn't drive us, and there was only one church. And I was the only white guy. And I walked into this church, and it was, I don't I didn't even know what time it was. I got there, I guess, like 9 o'clock, something like that. I go in, the music's already started, people are doing this thing. And they, the, uh, the usher comes up to me, and I actually, I said I was the only white guy. I had three or four people with me that were, that were with me, you know. And, and th they got us, and they said, we're going to give you a special seat. And the usher walked me all the way down, and they set us in the middle of the front row. Two and a half hours later, we had to leave. The sermon had not yet started. That day, they took up the offering seven times. It was, it was the most unique thing I'd ever seen in my life. But here's something I'll never forget. There was one time they took up an offering. They called it the cheerful offering. There was a trash can sitting in the front of the room. And in order to come down and drop an offering in it, you had to dance your way there. And I remember this, this, this large urban guy coming out of his pew. And he was just all, woohoo! And he was dancing, spinning circles. And walked his way down and walked up and slam dunked the offer. Like, you know, and I, and, and I know that you, you might be thinking that's strange or odd or whatever, but here, here's what I am saying. Our, we're supposed to be cheerful about this. And, and I want you to understand something. With God in a relationship, it's not always what you do. 
Sometimes it's how you do it or what your attitude is in doing it. Husbands, get this. Your wife is pretty similar. It's not always what you do. It's why you did it. What's the motivation behind it? What, 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 what's really going on in your mind there when you did that, okay? So you wash the dishes. That's, that's fine. Did you wash the dishes because she yelled at you? Or did you wash the dishes because you loved her and you wanted to do it? There's a difference. See, God wants us to be cheerful in our contribution. He, he does. This is a beautiful thing. We're supposed to smile about it and enjoy it and get excited. So what you're not going to have is a pastor here who goes, God is disappointed in you. So am I. I'm not going to do that. It doesn't mean he's not. It doesn't mean I might not be from time to time. But that's not the point. The point is we have the opportunity to be reliable and sacrificial and cheerful. And in all things, God brings blessing into our life we bring blessing around us, and it makes us more thankful for all that God did to begin with. Make sense? I love you guys. Would you pray with me? Lord, we want to make sure that our attitude is always right. We want to be cheerful contributors. Cheerful in the way we serve with our time and our talents and our abilities. Cheerful in the way that we contribute financially. Father, we also desire to be sacrificial. We realize that it needs to cost us something. It needs, to, it, needs to, it needs to require loss in our life in order for it to do in us what it's really supposed to do. Lord, help me remember, help us remember that my serving in a ministry or my contributing financially ultimately is not about that ministry needs my time or that offering plate needs my dollar. The issue is about what God's doing in my heart and sacrificing from what I want to give to what God wants is one great, great way that He can change my heart. Make us cheerful. Make us sacrificial. Lord, build our ability to be reliable, trustworthy. That, Lord, I, I want my church to be able to count on me. We need to be able to count on one another. Lord, this is so much more than a spectator sport. This is our life. This is, these are the people you've put us with to do the things in this world that you care about. Jesus, we trust you. We are blessed. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you guys so much for being here today. Um, your handout should have announcements and things in it that you need to make note of. Uh, make sure you, you, you focus on that. Next week, we're going to begin a new teaching focus on the Advent season leading up to Christmas. And uh, I'm not giving it a fancy name or anything like that, but we're just going to really look into what God has done by sending his son here uh, to be one of us. Thank you so much for being here today. I hope you have a wonderful, wonderful afternoon. Uh, and, and let's continue that spirit of Thanksgiving, okay? Have a great week, everybody. See you later. Wow, what a great day we have had together at Community Fellowship. Even right now, if you're watching this live, people are still praying and they're still dealing with what it is that God is guiding them to do in their life. God's bringing healing and he's bringing relationships back together. Lots of exciting things. Maybe God's doing that in your life. And we wanna be helpful to you. As you respond to the Lord and continue following him, maybe we can help you further. Check out our website, cfbc.tv. Find out all the details, ways that you can connect. If you live in Western Kentucky, then come join us on a Sunday morning at one of our live gatherings. They're at 8.30 and 11, and we've got great Bible study for all ages at 9.45 in between the two. We're on Highway New, 40, New Highway 45 between Lone Oak and Mayfield. We'd love to have you any Sunday. Have a great week.